Welcome everybody to another brand new episode of It's My Wrestling Podcast. I'm of course, as always, your host Chris Dees. Before I get started, like I always ask, please hit subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Please hit follow if you're listening on audio platforms. Today's guest is a man I'm very excited to speak to. I know I say that every single time I interview anybody, but it's just a pleasure to talk to these guys. It really is. Um, He is one half of Black and Brave, head trainer of one of the best wrestling schools anywhere in the world, and he even runs his own promotion, SCW. You pro. He is, of course, the one and only Mr. Marek Brave. Marek, thank you so much for giving me your time. How's it going? Ah, it's going well. Uh, excited to be here. It's quite the introduction you had for me there. I didn't realize I did all these things until you said them. So, <laughs> yeah, man, I always I like to hype my guests up as much as I can. Um, it's nearly Christmas. We're recording this like five days before Christmas. Have you got any any plans? Oh any gosh, plans yeah. The holidays. Oh, yeah. You know, I have two kids. I have a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old, so I always look forward to Christmas for them. You know, like, I'm not I'm not much of a Christmas guy myself, um, but when I had kids and, and I got to celebrate the holidays with them, it was more of a, a situation where I get to watch them open the presents and, and see their faces light up, and that makes Christmas a little more special these days. So, looking forward to it. Absolutely. No, my son is um, nearly one and a half, so this Christmas he's going to hopefully start understanding things a little bit more. Yeah. Like, see, Get to watch him tear through some presents. Yeah, other people's presents, probably. Yeah. <laughs> they do that, right? Because they don't know how to read their own name yet. So yeah. they just start ripping open other people's presents. You're like, wait, wait, wait. That one's that one's up for you. Hold on. Pass that down. And then they get disappointed and you're like, oh, no, Christmas is ruined. He's like, oh, that's shiny. That must be for me. No, 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 no. No, you have your own pile. <laughs> your own pile but yeah all right we'll see how it goes it's probably going to be chaos but that's christmas isn't it that's christmas exactly right that's chaos. that's what it's all about it's all about relaxing but also being stressed out so <laughs> yeah I, I don't know if there'll be any relaxing going on no probably not probably not awesome right i'm gonna get straight into things like i said thank you so much for joining me got loads that i want to ask you about um first sure. things first and See, even as a podcast host, I tend to not watch other podcasts. I don't like to watch or read other interviews because I don't like them to sort of um, interfere with my own interviews. I just want to ask what I want to ask. So I apologize if you've been asked any of these questions before. You must get asked so much about Seth Rollins. So I want to keep that to a minimum as much as I can. But Oh, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. For anybody who doesn't know... How did you end up opening a wrestling school with Seth Rollins? Because I know I know you've been friends for a very long time. You wrestled together, but sort of like whose idea was it? Was it something you both wanted to do? That's funny because when he does interviews, uh, he says it was my idea, <laughs> but it was actually his idea from the start. I was doing a, a little training school myself with just some local kids here in Davenport, Iowa, uh, and it, it was going decently, um, but you know, when you get the star power behind the school, like, like Seth has obviously. And even at that time, uh, when we first opened, he had just kind of made it to the main roster a few months uh, prior with the shield. Um, but obviously you, you get that star power behind it and there's going to be a little bit more of a, uh, of a name recognition deal and, and you're going to get more people signing up. Um, so I was just running my own little thing here uh, with some local people and, and uh, I was at my job one day and he just texted me out of the blue and said, hey, when I moved back to Iowa, he was still uh, down in developmental at that time. When I moved back to Iowa, how would you feel about running a school with me? <laughs> and, you know, we'd always made a, a great partnership uh, in years prior. So I figured, you know, let's team up again. Let's give this a go and let's do it. So it took a little while. He wanted to get established on the main roster before we just opened a school. He didn't want to, you know, it's that, that thing in wrestling where you don't want to do too much too soon and look like you're, uh, you know, look like you think you're bigger than you are, you know, which seems silly in hindsight, considering what he's done since then. <laughs> but uh, so we waited a little bit, I would say about nine months to a year after that initial conversation before we finally opened the doors to, to black and brave. But uh it's been a wild ride since then, man. Is it ever, I don't know if annoying is the right word. Obviously, you're very good friends. You've been friends for for many, many years. But is it, do you ever? Yeah, going on going on 20 years now. We've been, oh, wow. we met, we actually met the day before I turned 16. And he is uh, just, uh, just shy of a month older than I am. His birthday is May 28th and mine's June 26th. Um, 
And so he was 16 at the time. I was a day from turning 16. We're both 35 now. So this summer, it'll be 20 years since we met each other and, and became friends. Man, I am not friends with anybody from 20 years ago. Like, I'm 32. <laughs> I don't think anybody I knew at 12. I don't think I, I, I you know, I, kudos, kudos to you for maintaining a friendship for that long. Because I just can't be bothered. It's a lot that's of the that's the wrestling business right like yeah uh it tends to keep us together we we bond over a very specific common thing yes of course yeah yeah absolutely yeah absolutely um do you ever get potential prospective students coming in who just want to meet seth or just want to be like oh, seth yeah. or train like <laughs> seth is that annoying i imagine you get that a lot well um i wouldn't say we get it a lot it happens occasionally. Uh, and for me, at least from my perspective, that's a very expensive meet and greet. I believe you can sign up <laughs> for a WWE meet and greet for significantly less money. Um, but typically the majority of students that come through our school are interested in becoming uh, damn good professional wrestlers. And I believe uh, we allow that to happen. So um, it's, it's less, common than maybe you'd think but it, it does happen you get people that are just interested in in getting a what they consider to be a one-on-one -on -one experience with with Seth Rollins and uh, they typically don't last very long because we take our stuff pretty seriously um, and it's a difficult program to graduate from and it should be because you don't want just anyone in the professional wrestling business it's a tough business so we prepare students for that um, so usually you know they'll make it a day uh, at most, maybe a week. That first week's pretty tough, uh, and then they'll peace out. And they got their they got their meet and greet, and they got their one on one, and and uh, that's good enough for them. But Just we, we have a, a vetting process. We have an application process. All of our students have to write an essay about uh, you know their motivations for joining the professional wrestling business, and it's my job to kind of sift through those and decide. Uh, who should get in and who, who shouldn't. It's not like everyone who applies gets in. We have a limited amount of spaces. Um, but, you know, sometimes you get those fanboys or fangirls that slip through the cracks. And, uh, you know, I appreciate their donation to my mortgage, but <laughs> it doesn't work out well for them in the end. That's interesting. I didn't know, you know, I didn't even think that that might be a thing, having to do an actual application almost like a job application why you want the job that's i've never heard of that when it comes to wrestling or training or anything yeah i think we're a little unique we do uh because of rollins is a celebrity we do get a lot of applications multiple applications every day i think i spend uh, a good portion of my life reading applications from prospective students uh but yeah we want to make sure that the people who are coming through are genuinely passionate about professional wrestling because we are, uh, and we've made this our lives. Uh, and we wanna make sure that people that are coming through or have kind of the same mindset because it, it is a tough program. We're not interested in, in stealing anyone's money. And, and you know, you hear a lot of schools that they get the money and then they immediately try to like just rough people up to get them out. Like I, you know, I wanna, I wanna make them suffer so that they leave and I can get the money without doing any of the work. That's not what we're about. We want to make sure you're passionate about it so that after you pay for the experience, we can give you uh, exactly what you paid for. Yeah, and it's quite a short program, isn't it? Like it's 12 weeks, is that right? So you're paying... You know, I, that much. I, I wouldn't say that's, that's shorter than most programs, um, but we do, uh, maybe it's not advertised as much as it should be, but once you graduate our program, you're eligible to continue training with us at no extra cost ever. There's no monthly fee to be at the gym uh, and our gym's open six days a week. Uh, and that's in ring, that's uh, workout stuff. We have uh, you know a full array of, of fitness equipment and whatnot. Um, so once you graduate, as long as you graduate 12 week program, you can continue training with us for as long as you'd like at no extra cost. So uh, I think after all is said and done, a lot of schools do charge a monthly fee after you graduate. I think our school ends up being a lot cheaper than than some of those other programs if you if you're in it for the long haul. Yeah, and that's nice. It's not like here you go, twelve weeks, see ya, bye bye, all done, never see right. them again. That's nice that you sort of still have that that contact and that. Um... Yeah, 
and and even the students who do leave to go back home wherever they're from um they have the option to send in matches that they may have wherever they go and we review those both myself and seth will review those for free no extra charge on that either so no oh, very nice very nice that's a nice little extra touch there um so one one thing that I always wonder about training schools, I've interviewed um, Jazz, Dr. Tom, Al Snow, Lance Storm, former wrestlers who have gone into training, gone into having their own academies and schools, and I always wonder how much actual like one-on-one -on -one time they get with with the trainees, with the with the students. So is Seth particularly present at the school, or is it more you run the day to day, and then Seth just sort of like obviously he's he's pretty much always involved in major feuds. On WWE TV, so I imagine his time is quite limited. Uh, in a way, but I think that's what makes our school unique uh, compared to a lot of other schools. And in fact, there's no other school. If you look at the history of professional wrestling schools, there's no other school uh, that has had an active WWE superstar at the top of their game training while they're still there. Usually, you get somebody who is retired um, or taking a break. Uh, as in the case of Shawn Michaels when he was doing his deal, um, or you get somebody who's, you know, not to not to throw anyone under the bus, but you know, at, the, at a lower level, Seth's a multi-time WWE champion, wildly successful in this business, yet he's still getting input from Vince McMahon, Triple H, uh, whoever it may be, and then like the very next day, coming back to Davenport, Iowa, and passing down that knowledge to people who are just entering into the business. And I feel like that's a great selling point for our school because you're not going to get that anywhere else. Uh, and you've never gotten that anywhere else. We're the only school that can claim that. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. But yeah, he's there quite often. He's not there every day uh, as his life has changed. He's a father now. Um, but he's there you know, quite often uh, imparting that knowledge. And yeah, there is a uh, plenty of one-on-one -on -one things. You know, you can reach out to him, ask him questions, pick his brain, um, which is oftentimes more important than just the in-ring stuff, right? Like, like you can learn how to do a body slam from every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there, you know, as long as they were trained properly, they can show you how to do a body slam. But to get someone who can explain the nuances of psychology, and storytelling at an extremely high level. Um, things that we really focus on. I think, again, that's another reason our school um, is, is, in my opinion, head and shoulders above the rest is because we put an emphasis on the psychology, the storytelling, the selling, the things that really make professional wrestling outside of just the cool moves, uh, so to speak, you're going to get that instruction from somebody who is, is a master at that. And you're going to be able to pick his brain and ask him those questions, whether that's via a DM, an email, or in person. Um, and so I, I really do feel like that's why um, we turn out such well-rounded individuals instead of just the guys that can do the, the flips and this, that, and the other. Yeah, I think, I think it's a... Uh a misconception now, wasn't it? I think young wrestlers getting into the business think, oh, if I can do all the big moves and all the cool high spots, that's all I need and then I'll get ahead. But um, Al Snow was one who told me he trains people... Um, he trains people in, like, behind-the-scenes things, so, like, the politics of wrestling. Um, oh, for sure. Just how to be with people backstage, how to, uh, how to put up a ring and take apart a ring, doing camera work and things like that. There's so much... Yeah, oh... Yeah, we, we definitely do the same. It's funny you mentioned because we're actually uh, in the Al Snow uh, tree of professional wrestling. Our trainer, Danny Daniels, who runs AAW in Chicago, Illinois, um, one of the major independent promotions here in the United States, he was trained by Al Snow. We were trained by him. Our students are trained by us. So actually everybody that comes through our school and myself and Seth included, we're of that uh, Al Snow training tree so to speak Bloody tree yeah oh, very cool i didn't know there's so many yeah you don't realize like how connected people are within the business it's a small world yeah such a small world yeah definitely um you sort of answered a question that i wanted to ask already but i'm going to ask it again anyway um so what i always wonder as well is like with seth obviously seth is 
He had a great career on the indies, Ring of Honor as well. And I know obviously you yourself had a long career on the independents before you retired as well. Um, obviously, Seth has since leaving the indies gone to WWE, which is a very unique style, let, shall we say, like wrestling for TV, wrestling for WWE, wrestling a very particular way that they want to. We don't often see that exciting independent style on TV very much. You, you do if you watch AW, Impact, Ring of Honor, those those kind of places. So you've both got very different styles, I would imagine. Does that translate into your training as well? Do you try and... I know you said, obviously, Seth pass, passes on his knowledge from WWE, from Triple H, from Vince McMahon, things like that. But do you try and sort of, like, separate the independent from... From I don't know if that makes sense, but do, do you? No, want... it does make sense. Uh, I think I get what you're getting at there. And in a way, we try to blend the styles, right? right. We're not going to tell anyone to not do their cool moves yeah. or to not do their high spots, their dives, you know, their head drops, whatever it may be. But what we really try to emphasize is uh, the fact that you need to make that matter. You need to make it important. Uh, what's the point of getting dumped on your head just to get a little golf clap when you could get a, an ex exciting reaction, a big pop, so to speak, um, from doing the exact same move or the exact same spot or whatnot. We're not telling you not to, not to do those things. You know, there's the old adage that less is more. And we don't teach less is more. We teach get more out of less, so to speak, right. where you don't have to do 27 dives, head drops, crazy spots, whatever. You can do a handful of them and get even bigger reactions based on where you place them in your match, what you do before you do those things, what you do after you do those things. Uh, you know, just, just taking the time to let everything simmer, let it register, and then allowing the audience to anticipate what's going to come next instead of just rapid fire, boom, 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 boom. And that's not to say that you can't do those things, but if you structure everything properly uh, and you, you, you put some time and effort into thinking about uh, that way of wrestling, you're going to be able to get more out of quote unquote doing less. You know what I mean? Like, does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I like, for example, I used to love super kicks. Super kicks growing up were probably my favorite move. And now you. That used to be my finishing move before everybody used yeah, it as <laughs> 27 setups for whatever spot they were going to do. Yeah. Suicide dives. That's another one. You see two or three suicide dives per match. Now that's what, that's one of my big gripes, right? The first time I ever saw anyone do that, I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, how do you get through the ropes without clipping his feet, whatever, whatever, right? Yeah. And now everyone does it and it's no longer impressive. And now I see a suicide dive and I'm like, that's not really that difficult. Like yeah. what else can you do? Give me a, an acai moonsault. Give me something off the top. Give me a twisting plancha. You know what I mean? Like uh, except for Samoa Joe, when he does that suicide dive and he he clubs you, man, that that looks impactful. That looks yeah, legit. When, when a big man does it, it, it feels it feels different, doesn't it? It feels special. I'm trying to think. Yeah, um, and scary. Canadian Destroyer, Canadian Destroyer used to be my favorite finisher, and now people use it as like a setup for the finisher. They use it. Like I'll a... tell you what. I I feel like uh, while not being in attendance for the first time it was ever done. I want to say I was there for maybe like maybe one of the first 10 times it was ever done. Um, I did security for a show uh, just 10 minutes from my house in Rock Island, Illinois. I live on the border of Iowa and Illinois here in the States. And Petey Williams was wrestling someone, I don't know. And he busted out uh, the Canadian Destroyer and everyone was like, it's <laughs> the craziest thing I've ever seen. And then literally like six months later, everyone was doing it every match and you didn't get the same pop that you got so it's just one of those deals that's how it works right yeah and now people are trying to sort of like do super canadian destroyers so you'll get one off the top rope or you'll get it off the ladder and i just watch it and i think well that's obviously that's very cool and i respect how hard that must have been to do but all all you're doing is just doing it from a little bit higer up like it's still the well, same. and and like is it 
is it that much more difficult to do? Like, I'm talking about the one where like yeah, you maybe. jump from the top or you jump from the ladder and then you just land uh, in the same spot yeah. and then do the flip. I'm like, that didn't yeah. actually do anything more. You know, I cut a promo once in IWA Mid-South on uh, Ricochet. He's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for a, for a long time. And, uh, you know, he does the 630, the double, the double uh, front flip. Or I think it was maybe the double moonsault, I think I was referring to in this in this promo. And I'm cutting the promo, which included far too much profanity, which uh, Chris Hero chastised me for after the promo in a nice way. Chris is a great dude. Um, but in the promo, I said, am I allowed to swear on this? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I said, I said listen, a double moonsault does the same fucking thing as one moon salt, you're still landing on him with your stomach, which got a big pop from the audience. Maybe not exactly what I was going for. I was turning heel in this promo and Chris chastised me for the amount of swear words I used. But I mean, you know, that's kind of tongue in cheek there, but it, it is true. Like a lot of these variations on these different things, they don't actually make it any more impactful in our in our little agreed upon uh, world of professional wrestling where we agree that this hurts more than this and yada, 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 yada. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess it makes it look cooler. And for some people that uh, that makes it more interesting. So, yeah, it's all subjective, isn't it? Different people like different things. I'm not going to. And that's cool. I don't want to come across as, you know, the old man yelling at clouds on the podcast, but uh, which is wild. Right. Cause I don't feel old, but I've been in the business for almost 20 years and, I still remember when I was the young 18 year old kid getting yelled at by veterans in the locker room for doing too much, but yeah, it's just the cycle of life in this business, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Let's stop talking about Seth Rollins. Now I appreciate you. Uh, like I said, must talk about him all the time. Um, but I want to move on to some of your graduates. So I know Zicky Dice is a guy that, that you trained and he's doing lots of fun things in the business at the moment. Signed for Impact Wrestling not too long ago. Uh, ben Carter as well. He's awesome. I'm not sure. I've not seen him for a little while, so I don't know what he's up to at the moment. But um, what were those guys like to work with? Because I imagine Zicky Dice, all respect to Zicky Dice, it seems like he might have been a bit of a handful. Ha! That's great. Uh, perfect lead in. He was. He, so he uh, had attained a little bit of celebrity before he came to train with us. He was in a, in a decently successful band. Yeah. Um, they had been on Warp Tour and all that stuff. So uh, he didn't come in with the same shyness or, or deference that other students may uh, come in displaying. Uh, and at times in this business, that can get you heat, so to speak. And so there were multiple times where I was just, hey, man, you got to calm it down a little bit. You got to settle down a little bit. And in one particular instance, um, he was doing a practice match towards the end of his 12 week training period and things weren't going well. And he kind of just kind of phoned it in towards the end. It didn't really give a crap about it and was just uh, trying to be goofy and silly, which is his natural personality. And he's great at it, by the way. Um and I kind of ripped into him afterwards. And I was like, hey, man, if you're not going to take this seriously, then you can just leave and, and come back tomorrow when you actually care about it. And he took offense to that. And we kind of started going back and forth a little bit. And uh, at that point, you know, I'm the head trainer of the school. I'm not going to take that. So I, I kicked him out. I said, you're done. Get out of here for the day. Uh, you come back tomorrow. And on his way out, he kind of like like bumped into my shoulder a little bit on the way out. <laughs> I was like, we're not doing this kid. I turned around, I shoved him a little bit. And I was like, if you want to go, we'll go right now. I'll let you know, you're not going to treat me like that. And we started screaming at each other. And eventually he just left. And he's like, I quit. I'm not doing this anymore. Which he immediately uh, regretted and he apologized for. And, and everything was smoothed over and he came back and he graduated. And, and make no mistake, we're good friends now and we still communicate on the regular and, and he's a great dude and I'm very happy for his success and he's apologized profusely for that situation and he's admitted that he was in the wrong but yeah man he's he's got a little edge to him but you kind of need that in this business to get ahead and to succeed Rollins I know we said we, were, we weren't going to talk about him but he had that same deal and when we first started training he would get heat from a lot of different people and they'd they'd pull me aside and say, Hey, you need to talk to your boy because he's, uh, he's pissing certain people off. 
uh, and he needs to kind of tone it down. And I'd be like, man, he is who he is. There's nothing I can do. I've talked to him about these things and, you know, that's just not the style that he's in, but we've seen where that's gotten him throughout the years and, yeah. and other people too, you know, CM Punk, uh, you know, we were on a lot of shows with Punk as we were coming up and, and he had that same kind of reputation, but we see where it got him. He's one of the most successful superstars over the last 20 years. So you need to have that edge. Zicky definitely has that edge and, and, I'm very excited for his success. And I know we're, we're kind of just scratching the surface of that. It's just the tip of the iceberg. And he's going to continue to, to, to move on and move up and, and do good, good things in this business. So um, yeah. Ben's uh, Ben was the opposite. Ben was very respectful. Maybe that British sensibility, you know, yeah. although does he count? Cause he's not from England. He's from Jersey, right? In uh, yeah. what is it? What is that uh, little island between? Is that the Isle the Isle of Jersey, right? Yeah, I think we 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 claim him like we sure. to say that he's one of ours. So yeah, <laughs> he sounds very similar to you. Uh, yeah. it, we were man. It's like my favorite thing to to learn, uh, like the British slang for different things. We had very uh, intense conversations about the difference between biscuits and cookies, which I've learned there is yeah. no difference. Yeah. But then there are actual biscuits in America, which are like the fluffy things that you put butter on. And yeah, look, look, we I mean, put gravy on them because we're Americans. That's what we do. We <laughs> would call them uh, muffins or scones, but I know you call muffins. But then we have different muffins and different scones. So we get into very heated arguments yeah. over what was the difference between a cookie and a biscuit. Uh, and then there's just there's this great story where Ben, uh, he lived in a bunkhouse with other uh, students at the time and Ben is not the cleanliest person out there uh, doesn't like to do the dishes after uh, after he's soiled some <laughs> some uh, some cookery and uh, he was getting chastised by a, a fellow student for not cleaning up after himself after making food and then eating food and he said that he didn't need to wash the forks and knives because there was countless amounts of cutlery, mate. Uh, and we, to this day, years after he's graduated and gone on to attain the level of success that he has, we will tease him by saying countless amounts of cutlery, mate, over and over again, because that's not something that we'll say here in America. Nobody calls it cutlery, uh, at least if you're under a certain age. But, uh, you know, Ben was great. Ziggy's been great. We have other students who are doing amazing things, so we're we're excited to have all of them. Yeah, man, absolutely excited to see what what more comes through Black and Brave. Absolutely. Um, so I wanna I wanna talk about you and your own personal career a bit. I know obviously you had um, career ending surgery. We've seen <clears throat> sort of when when did it start? Probably in the last like five or so years. We've seen the likes of. Daniel Bryan, we've seen the likes of Edge both come back from from career-ending injuries, never never going to be able to wrestle again. Paige, she's another one who is apparently teasing being on the verge of coming back. Is is there any potential that we could ever see you come back out of retirement? Is is there any desire for you for you to do that, or are you happy with with where you are now? You know, it's difficult, right? Because I'm 35 years old. Uh, I still have a mind for professional wrestling. Like I I feel like at least uh, intellectually, I still have the ability to do it. Uh, physically, that's a different story. I did have the uh, spinal fusion surgery a couple of years back. My C5 through C7 vertebrae, excuse me, in my neck, uh, they're fused together. It makes it difficult to do a, a lot of different physical things. Um, sometimes I can actually do the workout or the lifting or whatever. And then for like the next five days straight, excuse me, for the next five days straight, I, I feel like Frankenstein. Like I've got a two by four stapled to my spine. Um, and I'm in a lot of pain and discomfort and whatnot. Um, and I, I actually get asked, asked that frequently, like, well, Edge came back. He had the surgery. Why can't you come back? And I typically tend to answer that Edge had millions of reasons to come back um of which i do not have if you know what i mean uh it's a little bit different on my level to where he's at and where Paige is at and where uh brian's at 
Um, so I won't say never. It's the professional wrestling business after all. I think, you know, we've seen multiple retirements from the same individuals and then they come back when the yeah. when the story's right or the money's right or whatnot. So I won't say never. Certainly my style would have to be um, changed up a little bit and I'd have to take into consideration that I can't do some of the crazy things that I've done in the past. Um, but I would say that I'm very happy with my role in the business right now as a trainer and a promoter. Uh, it feels weird to be like a veteran in the business, like, and not just like, Oh, he's been in for five or six years. You know, he knows what he's talking about. Like, but we're coming up on like 20 years in the business, like a year and a half from now, I'll be 20 years, two decades in the professional wrestling business. And it doesn't really feel like that. I can still remember when I was the 17 year old kid who, who was just breaking in and, and uh, you know, deferring to all these veterans who have been around for so long. Um, but yeah, I guess I have been doing it in a while. And a lot of my peers have moved on and, and signed with WWE or just straight up retired and, and faded into obscurity. But uh, I'm still here. I'm still doing it to the best of my ability, at least, you know, in a, in a coaching way, giving people advice and, and uh, helping to shape them into the best version that they can be of themselves. Um, and there's no plans to, to leave that anytime soon. I hope I can do this until I'm in my 50s, 60s, 70s, you know? It's just, wrestling is a big part of who I am. It's a big part of my, my personality. And, and uh, I'm happy to, to have it, you know? I'm happy to have something like that. Well, you've been doing it for life. over half of your life. Oh yeah, Ooh. crazy. Ooh. Like that, it's crazy, isn't it? Like to, it to... is weird when you say it like that because it's a hundred percent accurate. Yeah, and to hear you say, "Oh, a veteran," and then I think he's like, "You're only like three years older than me, and you're a veteran at something." That's that's crazy. Like if if I hadn't seen you and I didn't know how old you were going into this, and somebody said, "Oh, Marek Bray's been doing this for about twenty years," I'd think, "Oh, okay, so he's like middle aged, probably like mid to late forties, early fifties, but." To only be 35, like you said, and, and have that much experience, 20 solid years, like you, as you say, you could easily do this for another another 30 years, another 40 years. If I'm lucky, that would be great. I, I think I was lucky to get involved with it uh, at a young age and, and to just be around the right people. It, it's kind of strange in a way, you know, like I met Seth when I was 15, about 16 years old, uh, and he's just so focused on and always has been like it's crazy, right? From the moment I met him, he told me, well, I'm going to wrestle for WWE someday. Uh, I'm going to main event a WrestleMania, which he has in, in a way with his involvement in WrestleMania 31. Uh, and like at the time you look at him, you're like, you're crazy because that doesn't exist back then. There's no, uh, there's no history of independent performers making it to WWE at that time. CM Punk hadn't arrived. Uh, uh, Claudio hadn't arrived. Uh, Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson hadn't arrived. Like these things, all those guys were still in the indie. So there was no history of moving up. And so he's telling me these things matter of factly, not just saying, well, that's my goal. He's saying, well, that's going to happen. And I remember like almost mocking him in a way. I mean, like, oh, okay, buddy, maybe get your mom to wash the grass stains out of your jeans, backyard wrestler, before you dream of, of, of WrestleMania. But man, like that's, like so Rollins, right? Like he'll, you, he'll say something outlandish and you'll like chastise him or mock him for it. And then he'll just immediately prove you wrong and prove himself. Right. Like it's, it's annoying in a way, but uh, yeah, it's wild. It's wild to just think about like the amount of people that I met and that were around, like the Midwest scene was just blowing up in those mid two thousands when we first broke in and you were on shows with guys like, CM Punk and Cole Cabana and Jimmy Jacobs and Alex Shelley and Chris Hero and, and Jerry Lynn and the list goes on and on and on of people who are just so intelligent in this business and who have shaped the minds of so many people in this business, uh, mine included, Seth's included. And uh, we were really lucky to have those people in our lives when we're first starting out. And I, I'll be grateful for that till the day I die. I'm I'm trying to think if the if the like who might have been the first to really sort of like break through from the independence. I don't know. Maybe CM Punk because that was that was quite a while ago now. When yeah, 
the summer of punk in, in Ring of Honor was what, like two thousand and God, I can't even remember. I I, re- I literally can't. Like yeah, you said, all of a sudden he was indie guy. I remember watching him on like the revamped ECW and being like, Man, that's wild. Like I was yeah. just on shows with him a, a a little while ago and now he's in WWE. That's just unheard of at the time. Yeah. Um Another shout out to guys like like Spanky, right? Like, like he was somebody that you could watch on Ring of Honor, and then you know he's on and Paul London, you know their tag team, which was which was fantastic. So you got Paul London and Spanky doing their thing, and like at that time you're just like, well, I think that's an anomaly, that's an aberration of of sorts. Um, And who would have thought it was really just the blueprint for what was going to come for years, for decades after that. Yeah, that's what I say. Like it just, it never ever happened, and then boom! All of a sudden, we just got this big influx. I don't know if maybe, maybe like TNA and Ring of Honor obviously helped, but I, I, I don't know. It just, yeah, it just seemed to happen out of the blue. Um, so I want to talk about you. You mentioned a couple of times briefly about how you're a booker and a promoter yourself as well. So obviously that's SCW Pro. Um, What's it been like the last couple of years owning your own and running your own promotion? Like, this is obviously, you know, at the end of the day, it's just wrestling. We, we've all been, we can all cope without wrestling for a couple of years, unless you're in the business, somebody like yourself. But as fans, everyone's like, oh, no, no, wrestling's been destroyed. It's, it's really not that deep. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we found other things to get us through the last couple of years. But what's it been like personally for you? Because not being able to run the school or not being able to run regularly at the school not being able to run shows what how did you did you find any workarounds to keep things running how how did you just like soldier on well the school was lucky enough we were able to take some precautions and different things and the united states uh whether you agree with it or not has been a little more lax on different things than other countries have so we didn't have these like significant and severe lockdowns that other countries had thankfully um and thankfully we've been able at least in our small community, we've been able to avoid anything super serious. You know, we had uh, certain students who would contract COVID and then we'd take a break for a little bit and get back to it, make sure everyone got tested uh, and tested negative before returning. And we've had different precautions and things that we've that we've taken to make sure that we stay as safe as possible. Um, so there hasn't been much of an interruption. I know one of our classes was delayed by about a month while we kind of navigated what the world would uh, look like uh, during COVID. Um, so we've been able to, to, to do things um, as planned for the most part, as far as Black and Brave goes. Promoting was a different story. I'm telling people, like, I'll have conversations with friends and family members, and I'm just like, it's the wrong time to be in the live entertainment business, <laughs> you know? Um, so my, my particular promotion, SCW Pro, uh, here, in, here in Iowa, which features a lot of black and brave graduates, mostly black and brave graduates at this point. Um, we had to to change the way that we do things for for uh, maybe about six to eight months. We transitioned to uh, a Patreon, so we were recording matches at the black and brave gym, running storylines. Um, it did allow us to get a little more creative. We we dabbled and dipped our toes in the cinematic matches that WWE had had kind of pioneered and uh, maybe not even just WWE, like Matt Hardy was doing those things yeah, yeah. Um, prior to that and doing a great job, mind you. Um, and so we, we dabbled our, uh, we dabbled in that, dipped our toes in that and, and turned out a couple cinematic matches that I felt uh, turned out really well, especially on an independent level. Um, and then we just did Patreon tapings where we would just film the wrestlers having the matches. We'd edit them later on. We throw them up on our Patreon and our, and our uh, core fan base, our diehard fan base. Subscribe to that, and they were able to to keep up with our storylines and stuff. That's something that I like to focus on. Going back to our our uh, you know early parts of this conversation, where you know for me, wrestling isn't wrestling. You know what I mean? Wrestling is entertainment packaged as wrestling. It's the same as a movie. It's the same as a play. It's the same as music. It's the same as a book, right? We're just telling stories um, that are packaged as professional wrestling. So we were really able to lean into our storytelling um, and things like that. And it was fun. It, it 
got tiring after a time though, because you film it and you go, well, I hope that went well, but you don't know. Cause you go, you don't get that instant reaction. You don't get that instant gratification from a live audience that tells you, Hey, that was good. You came up with something good there. Um, so we'd film it, edit it a month later, it would go on the Patreon. People would watch it and then we'd get our reaction via typed out words, you know? Yeah. Uh, oh, hey, that was neat. That was fun. We liked it. But by that point, we had already been filming other things with the hope that it was going well. <laughs> so we didn't really have an option to pivot uh, into something different. So uh, eventually after a time, we were able to get back to doing outdoor shows. Uh, and then after a few months of doing that, we were able to get back to doing indoor shows um, with not mask requirements, but uh, mask, um, you know, we encourage mask, mask wearing. Um, it's wrestling, you know, so we have a, a particular audience that, that uh, enjoys what we do, especially here in the Midwest. So I'm not gonna say that everyone's masked up, but uh, you know, that we, we encourage masking if you're unvaccinated. Uh, and I mean, at this point with, with the variants going wild, uh, we encourage masking regardless. I know m myself, I wear a mask wherever I go, as long as I'm indoors and whatnot. And, you know, with it being winter out here, I'm indoors quite a bit. So um, it was difficult. It was difficult to navigate, um, you know, not to be cliche, but this new world we're in. Um, but hopefully, I don't know. I, I'd like to say hopefully we'll be out of it soon. But But to tell you the truth, I'm not... I'm not that encouraged with the way things have been going as of the last couple of weeks. I think we're in it for the long haul and we're just going to have to navigate this uh, as best we can for as long as we can. Yeah. We um, said at the very start, didn't I? Um, we're, we're recording this like four or five days. What day is it today? The 22nd. So yeah, a few days before Christmas. Um, and in the UK, it looks like they're talking about, another sort of like a mini lockdown they call it a circuit breaker lockdown for two weeks maybe four weeks it might start after christmas it might start before christmas they might have to close down how many people you're allowed to have inside from different households like nobody really knows what's going on we were we were so close to having a normal christmas so close after last year and it's just it's just gone uh for lack of a better word an english expression it's gone tits up Again, nobody really, knows, <laughs> nobody really knows what's happening. Um, let's let's hope obviously everything is okay. And if it is okay, what have you got planned for SCW in the new year? Have you got any now? If you know, once things are back to normal, have you got anything big on the horizon? Yeah, we actually have quite a few big things. The early part of the year is a big schedule for us. Um, we mirror WWE, or excuse me, WWE in a way. Um, so we'll do our Rumble event here in a couple weeks in early January, um, which is always a, a highly anticipated event for us as you know, other companies would attest to, it's just a fan favorite. And then we have our WrestleMania, which we call Epic um, coming in early April. And we've got a couple uh, guests lined up for that. I don't know if I can give away okay. too many spoilers right now, but we got a couple of, uh, of recognizable names coming in for, for those, uh, shows which i think i've already given away a spoiler we're going to do uh, much like wwe we're going to do a two-night event uh, ours won't be back to back we'll do them on uh, on uh, different dates a couple weeks apart in the month of april we've got multiple venues that we run in our state so uh, i just thought it'd be a nice treat for each venue to have one of our our bigger shows um, with a name coming in for each um, and big matches for the fans to be excited for so that they need to come to both events, which will be good for us. It'll be good for them. And, uh, yeah. and hopefully we'll be able to keep this independent wrestling thing going for as long as, uh, as long as COVID will allow. As COVID lets us yet. <laughs> Who knows what will happen by April too. So we'll be ruled by something we can't even see. It's great. Great, isn't it? Jeez. Awesome. No, I'll be keeping an eye on that. That sounds fun. Sounds exciting. I'm uh, interested to see who those big, major, secret names are going to be. Um, I want to. I want to wrap the interview up now. I'm going to ask you one more question. First of all, thank you so much for joining me. It's such an eye opener to. I, I love getting. I love getting the perspective of people from different. Well, different perspectives. You know, like I don't always just want to talk to active wrestlers. I love talking to managers. To 
trainers to coaches to referees to commentators so thank you for for opening my mind and my eyes to to different way of seeing things i hope you have for for my listeners and viewers as well um i wanted to ask one more thing for anybody young any prospective student i know a lot of my listeners are sort of like in the key demographic let's say so like quite quite young most of my um my followers are in america as well so what what advice would you give what sort of what are maybe like the three the two or three key elements the key factors attributes i guess you'd say that any prospective young potential wrestler might need or 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 the three that you would look for if they were coming to your school specifically so you know when i began um when I began with the idea that I could potentially become a professional wrestler where I could go to a professional wrestling school, I know one thing that helped me a lot was educating myself about the business um, and not educating yourself in an ideal way. Like, Oh, it, in a perfect world, this is what the business will be. Yeah. It's not a perfect world. And there are great things about the professional wrestling business. And there's some shitty things about the business as well. But you need to educate yourself about both. And you need to be prepared for both. You need to understand it's a tough business filled with tough people. And not everyone's going to be nice to you. And not everyone's going to want to help you along the way. So you have to be kind of uh, leery of that. You have to be able to decipher who is genuine and who wants to help you and and who uh, may be ready to stab you in the back at any moment. So um, I I watched a lot of documentaries. I I read a lot of biographies um, from wrestlers trying to learn what it was going to be like those first few years in the business, learning about training, um, learning about first starting out and people... uh, being cool to you and being shitty to you sometimes. That's just how it goes. Um, But prepare yourself mentally and then prepare yourself physically as well. Wrestling's tough. You have to, while I'm not one of those guys that's going to sit here and say wrestling is a sport. I don't think wrestling is a sport. Wrestling's entertainment. Uh, Again, packaged as a sport. Uh, That doesn't mean that you don't have to be athletic to do it because you do. You do have to be athletic to do it. So prepare yourself physically. Understand it's a tough business. You need to be in shape to do it. Don't show up grossly out of shape and think that, oh, well, by doing this, I will get in shape. Yeah. Get in shape before you start. Uh, you know, they don't, uh, you know, professional football players, American football players, mind you, don't show up to, <laughs> to training camp completely grossly out of shape and expect, well, I'll just do some sprints and, and a couple dumbbell presses and I'll be ready to go and play a game. It's the same with professional wrestling. You know, do some push-ups, run a mile or two, <laughs> you know, get yourself physically prepared, physically prepared, mentally prepared, uh, and then you'll you'll have the best chance of succeeding. Also, don't come into it with the expectation that I'll finish the 12 weeks of training and I'll get a contract with NXT right away. It's not how it works. You have to put in the time. You have to put in the effort. It's uh, something called sweat equity uh, to even get a shot at that. We're not black and brave. Isn't a, a one-stop shop to, to get you an NXT contract or an AEW contract, you know what I mean? We're going to put the tools in your toolbox to allow you to build something of value later on. And if you work at it and you put in the effort and, and, and you attain that level of success that's needed before getting noticed by these larger companies, then, then you will get that opportunity, but it's up to you to do it. Um, we have connections and we can help you when we feel you're ready, but only you can get yourself ready for that. So I think those are my, my biggest things. And then just keep your head down, keep your mouth shut. Don't, uh, don't piss people off along the way. Um, show some respect for those who have come before you uh, and, and you'll get there eventually if you want to, but it's, it's a tough road and you have to, 
you know, we always say you have to eat a lot of shit sandwiches and learn to like the taste. <laughs> That's professional wrestling training in a nutshell. That's a very, very good um, motto. I've never heard that before. You're going <laughs> to eat a lot of shit and learn to like the taste. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that a lot more often now. That's some great advice to Marek. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure any prospective young wrestlers listening to this or watching this will take that on board. Marek, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. But before I let you go, where can people find you and where can they find the school on social media, websites, any channels that you've got, YouTube, etc.? All right. Well, first, I'm going to pimp out the thing that makes me a little bit of money for my independent promotion. Follow SCW Pro on Patreon at patreon.com backslash SCW Pro. Um, we've got new matches on there. We've got classic matches uh, involving Seth Rollins and myself. Uh, we've got interviews, shoot interviews, uh, cinematic matches. It's, it's a fun time and it's only $5 a month. So if you can spare $5 a month to, month to support independent wrestling plus provide yourself some entertainment it's a good uh it's a good site for you um you can follow me personally on all social media well not all instagram twitter snapchat at mbrave13 i don't have a facebook i've never had a facebook it's just not something i've ever been interested in so don't try to find me on there and if you do find me on there it's not me it's a fake so don't <laughs> don't uh don't worry about it black and brave we you can follow us on twitter at black and brave and on Instagram at Black and Brave Wrestling, somebody had the Black and Brave handle, so um, Black and Brave Wrestling to keep up with all things Black and Brave. I know we're we're doing WrestleCon here in a couple months, so come find us at the WrestleCon uh, booth in Dallas, Texas. We'll have brand new T-shirts, classic T-shirts, and exclusively, this is the announcement right here. You're getting an exclusive Christie's. Okay. Uh, Death Rollins autograph posters never before available. You can grab those at our WrestleCon booth uh, down in Dallas, Texas during WrestleMania weekend. So it'll be a fun time. Very cool. Very cool. I will make sure I'll put all that down in the description as well so anybody can just click away on those links. Thank you again, Marek. This has been an absolute pleasure, an absolute blast. Guys, like I said at the very start, if you've enjoyed this, please hit subscribe or please hit follow depending on where you're watching or listening to this episode. And I hope to catch you again next time on It's My Wrestling Podcast.